All right, so everyone, welcome to the Community Service Committee meeting on Thursday, March 9th. We'll call the meeting to order at 529. First order is adoption of the agenda. Is there any additions or changes to the agenda? Okay, seeing none, I make the motion to accept. A motion to accept the agenda as presented. Okay, all in favor? Carried. The adoption of the minutes from January 12th, 2023. Uh, that is attached. Is there any changes or anything to the minutes? Anybody see anything glaring? Okay. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the minutes as presented. Okay. Motion on the floor. All in favor? Okay. So we have some delegations. Um, we have eight of them today, so we're going to give them 15 minutes um, each to present. So we'll try to stay on time because be respectful of everyone. Um, first of all, we're going to call the Blue Ridge Community League play Playground. Come on up. I'll get you to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jenna Wilson. I, um, I'm just here representing the play group. I'm from the Blue Ridge Community Library, and I just asked someone to Grant, so that's my year. Um, this is my second year now doing the grants for the play group. So a little history on the play group is they used to run in the building of the old uh, school in Blue Ridge, and so that building was closed, as I think you all know. So they had made an agreement with the community league to use the basement of the hall. So they had applied for a grant previously before I was around. They fixed up the hall, they had it all running, and Playgroup was good to go for quite a few years. Then they had some foundation problems, so the basement had flooded, and they lost quite a bit of their equipment. Um, they had brought in some people to repair the foundation, and they didn't do it correctly. So then that's when I had come in. I applied for our first grant just to get some of the equipment replaced and get us up and running again. So we got to the point where we ran successfully for quite a while and then it happened again where we had that secondary flooding or the second flooding. So um, we worked with the league and we got the problem fixed and it hasn't been flooding for the last about two years I would say. So we had a lot of items damaged. We uh, tried to repair what we could, but even a lot of it was outdated. There was a lot of really old toys that I don't think are safe for the kids, furniture that is rickety and some of it was moldy. Um, so that's why for two years in a row now I'm asking for furniture and um, for toys for the kids. Because I do, last year we had asked for $2,500, this year I'm asking for $35. So in the grant this year I did put in that we're looking for some small appliances. So um, the play group, which I know the grants do not work to cover rent. So we are trying to come to an agreement with the community league and to use the space as their funding is pretty tight as well. Um, in lieu of rent, we're looking to make our space a rentable space so we can be more sustainable. So we're looking to put in things that will attract people for birthday parties, small celebrations, things like that. So it's a secondary rental space in the hall. Um, so that's why we're trying to build up a bigger selection of the toys, the furniture, the storage items, and all of that. So um, we don't only have people that are from the town, but we do have a lot that come in the county. We have some that come from Anselmo, Goose Lake, uh, Fort Assiniboine, Marathorpe, White Court, and we've even had the odd one from Grand Prairie, Edson. So they do come, and when they're up visiting, they do participate in our playgroup. And because I'm in the library, I have seen the growth in our community. And when I started there, for example, we had um, summer reading programs that go every year. And when I started, we would have anywhere from two to five kids come. Last year, we had 82 kids register for that program. So we see the growth in the young families and we see with playgroup they have been running on and off like through the COVID and the flooding and they've used the upstairs of the hall which they still have anywhere from 25 to 55 people come 
participate. And not only is it parents and children, but we have grandparents coming, aunts and uncles, and it's just almost turned into a community um, socialization. People really appreciate having it just for the getting out of the house and the lack of that over COVID. So, yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Jenna? No question, but just a comment. I, um, you know, you, you bring up COVID and the lack of socialization through that period. Uh, I think what you guys are doing is uh, is a good initiative to to uh, reestablish the the norms, if you will. Right. But bottom line is the kids are having fun, right? And they're, they're learning, and I really like that sustainability uh, portion with the secondary rentals. Right, and it's. Uh it's big for the kids like I don't think people realize how important playgroup is I did it with both my children and it you know the development and the vocabulary they build and all of the sensory toys that we're building and purchasing with the grant money it's incredible for the kids to prepare them for school when the time comes and I think you see the difference in the kids that do participate in playgroups versus the kids that just jump right into school not prepared and I think that's a big positive when it comes to playgroups Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You're more than welcome to stay, or you can leave if you like. You can take a cookie and go. <laughs> the kids. I might need the children. Take it for the children. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. So next, we have the Blue Ridge Community League, the Golden Agers. Come on up. Get you to introduce yourself, too, please. Dwayne. My name is Dwayne Sharkey. I've been around Blue Ridge for 39 years, except for one little break. I moved to Salmon Arm. But the damn kids started having babies, so I didn't come <laughs> back. But anyway, to the seniors here, uh, we'd like to get the uh, ball moving on a few things, like mostly music, I guess, lack of a better term. It's, uh, we're going to bring in a couple of entertainers here in about a month. One of these guys, his name is Randy Holler. I don't know if you know him, who he is. How about Alfie Meyer? Well, way back when, Alfie Meyer was a, uh, he owns a music store in Edmonton. He supplied just about everybody in Northern Alberta with musical instruments. But that's neither here nor there. It's, uh, we're going to bring them in for one of our seniors' meals. We usually have them on Wednesday, but we're going to do it uh, in the month of May on a Sunday and bring those guys in. And we'd like to invite the uh, White Court seniors and the Fort Assiniboi in and just try to make it a bit of success as we can. We're, uh, our numbers kind of decimated with this uh, COVID thing, and it's it's really hurt us. We were about 50 to 60 members in 2018. Now, last meeting we had 16, but the, the weather was terrible that day. It was bitter, bitter cold, and then we had the next meeting after that. It was slippery and snowy. So. And seniors aren't really too uh, interested in going out into this crappy weather. And I can't blame them because if they hit the ditch or something, especially with our organization, we've got people who live on White Court Mountain that come out there and Fort Assiniboine, and Goose Lake, <laughs> all over the place. So we want to challenge a couple things. We want to get people connected again. And uh, we're in a bit of a dilemma here. I'm trying to keep uh, the older seniors happy. They all want to listen to, for example, like uh, Jim Reeves or somebody like that. But the new, junior seniors, I'll call them, they want to listen to the queen. Yeah. <laughs> so what do I do? <laughs> and I don't, it's a challenge. I remember this is the first year I belonged to this organization, and it's uh, 
it's going to have its moments. But I just, my in my heart, I want to get music going in Blue Ridge again. I, we start out with Randy and Alfie Meyer here next month, but I wouldn't mind proposing having every Sunday to have a, a jam session and bring people in because there's all kinds of entertainment out here, I understand. That kid in Marathorpe there, he's going to do some big shows in Saskatchewan this year. And this kid's just 20 miles down the road. Why aren't we utilizing this? Why? There got to be a lot of talent in this county that we could get to come out, but they have nowhere to go. So, you know, well, they've got places to go, but if we could get this set up in a... It's got to choose my words carefully. I just want to get some, some momentum going on this, and then we could bring in bigger names or whatever. Put Woodlands County on the map when it comes to tunes. Am I getting through to anybody? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you want to bring music to Woodlands County and Blue Yes, I do, and it's like uh, there's this guy coming with Forrest Cinnaboy, and the guy plays a fiddle. Uh, it's a good start with him. I'd like to get the whole community, the whole county going on something like this and we could bring in bigger names or whatever and make this a big destination for, for music. I don't know, it might take several years, but I'll tell you a little story. When we were living in Salmon Arm, we lived within 10 miles of four or five different communities. And every Friday night, one of those communities took over the show for the weekend, for that week. And the same musicians probably come from three, four different clubs. But every Friday night, they did one community hall, then they moved on to the next. And it didn't cost them anything to put it on, really. Because it was all, you no know, donated food. We, one place we went to, you'd, have to buy sandwiches for 50 cents a piece that were donated by some of the mothers or what, wives or whatever. And the uh, quality of the entertainment just came out of the woodwork. I couldn't believe it. There's one fellow that could play a banjo that uh, he went to Japan every spring for two months to teach the Japanese how to pick a banjo. But these, uh, it was just unbelievable. The, uh, turnout we had. I'd like to get some like this, some momentum going into that. There, we're just trying to recover from COVID. I just get connectivity to one another again and get because I'm in the post-COVID syndrome. I haven't visited my closest friends for two or three years like we used to. I used to go play cards all the time. It doesn't happen anymore. Just trying to keep the community viable out there. We've got some good people in that community league, and Jenna is worth her weight in gold. It's just <laughs> amazing what she's done for us. And she's young. <laughs> you don't see that much anymore. Okay. And <clears throat> I guess with if we work hand in hand with the community league and whatever else out there, we can achieve a lot. And I believe, uh, firmly believe that we've got the right people in place. And our uh, counselor is pretty gung ho with us, so we sure appreciate how he gives us feedback and keeps us in the loop of what we got to get done here. We're asking for about a $4,400 input into this, looking at our costs over the last few years. What we want to do now is Entertainment, for example, or a caterer, for example, is going to probably cost us $1,800 for three functions. And uh, the hall set up, we pay to get some young lady to come in and set up the hall for us, and it's all ready to go. And West End Rust Trip. West, first day is my new lips. 
So uh, the West End bus trip, we'll be trying to take a few of those. And I guess my, I had a lot of trouble doing this, doing this grand thing. Because in one of my employment positions there, when I was working still, you had to justify everything right down to the dollar. And uh, so I took that route, it just didn't work. So I got this done about two hours ago, <laughs> over and over and over again. We do have some money in the bank. We got about $4,300 in the bank now, but we'd like to use that as seed money. And when we get the momentum going, I could probably do a hell of a lot better presentation next year because I know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> did pretty well. Yeah, yeah you're doing fine. Well, doing just well I, uh, I majored in bullshit from my dad. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what all I have. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. I'm a little rough around the edges sometimes. Yeah, if you don't Absolutely. speak loudly, nobody hears you. Go ahead, Jerry. Just a quick question. I'm looking at uh, the expenditures, expected expenditures. Uh, you discussed 1,800 cater, uh, 300 for the whole setup, uh, meat donations, 300, and West End, 300. But then you've got function, and in brackets says thank you, 2,000. What does that mean? That was. That was. That was me. That was her. So we had a couple. I, I sent this in, and it looked pretty goddamn ugly. And I, <laughs> I just uh, was running out of time, so. I, yeah. It looks pretty ugly, but the oh, water will be good food supplies and hall set up. That could have been put in with the with the catered meals and the other meals uh, that we were trying to help our uh, potluck. And so buy a big ham one time, a big turkey next time, and be up that department. But I guess I should have put in with the catered meals and such. No, nope, we're, 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 we're I, I, yeah. we beefed it, we beefed it up. Yeah. The 2000 that Duane and I had a conversation about what they wanted was an actual, to pay the entertainer. So as a, as a thank you, as a, as right. more of a volunteer, thank you, keep going. So that's, that's why we put it in brackets more of a, because with, with, with FCSS funding, it needs to be preventable. It needs to be to encourage more volunteerism. So mm -hmm. this is as a, they'll bring in a, a more, Pricier entertainer, I guess we talked about. Well, yeah, well, yeah. we just want to get the quality of the entertainment yeah. up. So that's what that the 2000 was for. <clears throat> we have a really good entertainer on Blue Ridge there that's played all over Eastern Canada. And he's played down in uh, Nashville. He's been all over the place, but he just retired from working. So that's another. Uh, opportunity we have to get him going with us. And I guess if we, way back when in the Buckskins, anybody mm -hmm. remember the Buckskins? Yeah. Well, they mm -hmm. brought people in from all over the place. They're very well known. And they set the groundwork for us. And I believe that uh, we could carry that on. We, okay. we could do it, I believe. Got some able volunteers, senior volunteers to come along and go for this ride. I don't think the most the senior seniors there volunteer. That's all they've done all their life, and they're done. So let's let's get the younger generation going. That's right here. That's the answer, I tell you. You guys should be fortunate to have her here, which I don't think you can have her. <laughs> okay, is there any other further questions for Dwight? Thank you very much, and good luck with the... Yeah, well, see if what happens this time next year. Yeah, we look forward to it. <laughs> but we're, it's in the heart. Maybe it's kind of selfish on my part, because I love to dance. Oh, dancing. It's perfect. <laughs> but I twisted my ankle this afternoon, so I don't know why I came now. Maybe take a break today. Yeah. Yeah. It won't be long, you'll be up. Oh, yeah. I'll be in touch with
Okay. Right. You tell me to get out then? Yeah, I am actually. <laughs> <laughs> nice in the room for people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, Take care of your ankle. Cool. Yeah. Damn it's... grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Trip me up. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So next up we have the community lunch box. Volunteer recruitment and retention. <coughs> I'll get you to introduce yourself. <laughs> My name is Bridget Moore, and I'm the administrator and volunteer coordinator with the Community Lunchbox. Um, it, the Community Lunchbox has been in operating in Whiteport for 19 years this year. Wow. And uh, we provide, if anybody doesn't know, we provide um, food stability to uh, 10 different locations. Mm -hmm. So all the schools, uh, which includes um, Gateway, and then the, any place that kind of caters to young children, uh, such as the library, uh, BGC, and uh, we're also helping Precious Sprouts right now, um, so that um, all kids can learn on a full stomach, because we all know the benefits of that. And um, it wasn't in the, uh, with the thing, but I do have um, here just some stats, and I can leave them for you guys after. Just um, so year to date, just for the school year, we, since September, uh, we've provided 1,629 lunches or breakfasts. So it's usually a muffin, a fruit, and a, a yogurt. Uh, lots of the schools already have breakfast programs through the Breakfast Club of Canada. So, um, but where you can see, uh, for me, the need um, are lunches. Uh, we're almost at 5,000 lunches. Do you want me to pass one? Sure, actually. I think I printed enough. Um, 4,869 4, lunches, um, and then we started doing half lunches because the little kids, uh, they didn't want to see any waste, and so for little kids, they get a half lunch, um, and so we've done 465 of those, 249 bags of apples, 59 boxes of apples, and each box is 12 bags. Uh, and then we provide... Um, we, we work with the schools, uh, depending on the needs of the children, uh, you know, and, and what they're seeing they'll eat and won't eat. Um, for example, like we make sure the little, the schools with the little ones have smaller apples so there's less waste because they can't eat a big one. And sometimes even the apples are hard because they're losing their teeth so they can't eat them. So we introduce bananas. Um, we've given out, you can see 450, at one point we're doing individual bananas, um, but mostly bunches now, so 327. Bananas go over great. Um, oranges, bag, that's bags of oranges, not just individual. Uh, yogurt tubes, cereal bars, uh, cheese and crackers, applesauce, cracker boxes. Uh, this year we even had a request. There was uh, one school has a student that can't eat pretty much everything we offer because of diabetes. And so they get a diabetic lunch, which is just meat and cheese. And so we work with the schools to provide uh, the nutrition that the kids need. And um, we, our program is all inclusive, so we don't require the schools to keep track of who is using it. It's there for everyone. It doesn't matter why a kid needs it, we want them to have the ability to feed their bellies. Maybe they're having a growth spurt. And I know kids that come from homes that can afford food and they pack a big lunch and the kid's still hungry. <laughs> and so are, there is something there, so the kids don't have to try and learn while they're hangry. Um, I don't do well when I'm hangry. And there's, um, you know, m maybe it's a matter of they forgot their lunch on the bus and mom and dad are at work all day. You know, that takes the strain off the schools from having to provide out of their own pockets um, to provide that. And we just make sure that they always have it. And for like, for example, Little Sprouts, they, they ask for some different things like mini carrots because they're teaching kids nutrition. So at a very early age, we're getting to help with these kids to make sure that they understand nutrition and, and they have that available to them. Um, because as uh, I'm sure everybody is feeling the price of groceries nowadays, uh, some families are having to say like no to the healthier stuff because it's just really expensive. And so um, we're happy that we can help provide that where we can. So none of this happens though without a team of volunteers. And just like everybody else said, you know, there was COVID just kind of 
splattered everything out. Um, we lost a lot of volunteers uh, just because some moved, um, some retired, some don't feel comfortable in that situation of being together. Um, but we're building it back up and, and last year we, it was a great year for volunteerism and I feel now that this year with it more normal we'll even have hopefully more. Um, and because last year we had over 4,000 hours donated um, you know of people who gave time and a big part of that is delivering the food to schools I don't know if you ever go to IGA on Monday or Wednesday morning at 9 but I've got <laughs> volunteers there in piles of bins and we sort it out to which school they go to and then um, those people drive with their own gas and they drive up to the schools <laughs> and the locations and they deliver it and we Oh, it would take so long if it wasn't for our volunteers. So um, we want, so the grant that we're applying for is we want to be able to, you know, um, in any small way that we can say thank you. I'm sure if anybody's part of a nonprofit organization, finding volunteers um, is becoming harder and harder. You're competing with a lot of things um, to get those volunteers. You're competing with other groups for volunteers. Um, and so, you know, we, we have, um, for example, one of the things is, is hoodies. And we give them, that's not something we give to like a volunteer who volunteered once. These are the people that come every, we have one volunteer who comes every Monday and Wednesday and she has the route that has most boxes of apples and she's a senior, but she gets it done. She gets the boxes of apples and she gets them into the schools and rain or shine, she is there and she has been there for years. And she's just so amazing. And you know, it's people like that that we just want to be able to. Well, we tell them every day how much we love them, but we wanted to be able to, you know, go a little bit above and beyond and, and have it. And it's amazing when you have something that's community lunchbox. When I first started with the organization and I had my hoodie, um, people that know, and a lot of them uh, are people from, that have disabilities or barriers to uh, employment, because a lot of those people work for us or volunteer for us, and their face when they realize that you're part of the lunchbox it's like you are royalty you are famous they're like oh my gosh you're part of the lunchbox and i felt bad because i didn't even know this poor girl and she was a staff member i had just hadn't met her yet and yeah it's it's, it's quite a community and we want to keep that community and we want to include more people um one of the things that we were able to do last year with uh, the grant that we were given from Woodlands County is that um, we were able to have an appreciation uh, lunch for our volunteers. And the nice part about that is that everybody got to meet because it is a little bit secluded. Some of our volunteers pick up the bottles. Some of our volunteers help us um, with different things throughout and food. And so they don't always get the, the chance to meet. And all the volunteers feel very proud that they are helping this cause. They, and as well as our staff, they're very proud to, to help the community in that way. And so having them together, it was, it was a tingly feeling um, time that they got to meet and talk to each other. And, and again, it created an opportunity for our volunteers and staff that have um, disabilities that don't get out a lot, don't maybe get to socialize. Um, that opportunity to get together. So that's uh, that's kind of my spiel. Okay. okay. Is there any questions for Bridget? I just have one, and it's not necessarily related to this, but just for information. So, what's typically in a lunch? Um, so they get a either a wrap or a sandwich. Uh, so when COVID happened and we couldn't gather anymore, we lost all our volunteers that used to make the lunches, right? And so um, we went to IGA and we're like, we need help because they could do it. And so they've done it and they, they're so amazing to us um, in terms of making sure that we get the best price on what is yeah. there. Um, so they prepare it and um, so it's not specific, we just say lunch, so I don't know how they decide wraps versus. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, like a meat, lettuce, like there's different things in them. And then so you'll, for the big, the full lunch, you'll get a full sandwich or a full wrap. You'll get some grapes, usually, or so some fruit, fruit, and then, a and then uh, usually like a cracker. Okay. Yeah, goldfish crackers. So IGA is now preparing the sandwiches. That's what they're doing. Okay. okay. And they, so, what's a typical cost for one one lunch? Uh, I want to say. I'm not sure, actually. Um, our average monthly food bill is $5,000. Okay. 
um, it's for all the schools. Um, I'm sorry, I can get that to you though, but I- uh, I'm just curious, it's not like it's- Yeah. Some some of are in my head, like at one point, boxes of apples were $95 when we used to pay like 50 mm -hmm. or 40. Um, this last, and it just goes up and down, right? Mm -hmm. Supply and demand, every week it's different. Uh, I think we got it for $58 last week, right. um, but it has gone up to as much as 95. Okay, thank you. I don't have a question, but I'll just say thank you. As the principal of Percy Baxter School, I do see firsthand um, the impact of having those lunches and apples and snacks in a building full of hungry students, right? Um, whether it's they forgot their lunch or it's because there's no food at home. Um, the, the community lunchbox has been huge for us, and I would say for all the schools in White Court. So. And your staff is amazing at, like some people question, oh, well, <laughs> there are the sly little children that try to say, well, that looks better than what my mom gave me. But the teacher, like, the staff doesn't like let that happen. They're like, oh, no, you have a lunch. And so it does get distributed to those who need it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to introduce me now? Oh. Okay, so, um, because Tina's part of the, um, the, you guys are the victim mm -hmm. services. Eagle Tower. Yeah. Part of the Eagle Tower Victim Services. Um, she's going to present, and uh, she'll be on the other side of the table. I'll move over here. Seems awkward, but. Oh. Go ahead, Tina. You have 15 minutes. 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. All right. And counting. <laughs> counting. I got my timer on. So one it is. So. Thank you very much. Um, I am the program manager for Eagle Tower Victim Services and have been for, this is my eighth year. Um, we are in a bit of a transition year because we will be going regional in March. Um, it will be one year from this month, next year. So we will be um, doing some transitioning and hopefully, um, well, who knows with what May will bring if the election might change things, but we're just going to um, go as status quo and that's what we're doing and in the past uh, Woodlands County has been very gracious to us um, providing help for some of the things that are costs that uh, our grant doesn't cover through the Solicitor General that includes our KB cost which is QB so now it's King's Bench so those costs have changed and fluctuate year to year which we can't really budget for so um, in a year like COVID where courts were shut down for most of the time, we're kind of getting a lot of those cases brought into this year. So we have probably four weeks of KB full-time trials that we're going to be sitting in. Um, and that includes travel costs and um, they go with two people helping victims um, in the major cases that come to us on our desks. So. That we can't really budget for, so that's what we ask for um, from our municipalities to help us out um, in those areas. Uh, Community Lunchbox spoke about the volunteer um, piece, and that is our advocates that um, I think is very right. You know, we ebb and flow with volunteers in our community, but ours have stayed, and they helped us right through COVID. And we get one or two a year and they drop off one or two a year, but we have some well-trained people that um, come out in the middle of the night when there's a sudden death or suicide or something um, horrific that happens to community members. So these people definitely need to be thanked. Um, they never want it in a cash way. So it's usually with training is what we do. Uh, so set up, uh, we have some mental health stuff that we have to, it's like putting on the oxygen mask for yourself first so you can help others and that's what we do. We have mental health um, training coming up and team building. Uh, one another thing that um, is, is part of our world that we have to work together and uh, we always go in twos uh, for safety reasons obviously so that um, we have to be able to trust each other on those, you know, even just sometimes a hand signal means a lot when you're in a home um, with police that sometimes is dangerous. So we, we take that quite seriously. And then just 
I can't say enough about the hard work that our volunteers put in and the hard work that they do. And we want to be able to thank them. And like I said, we just do it in a way that we train them more and um, do some team building. So that's where the funds um, that we ask for will go. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments for Tina? Just a question relating to a comment you made. Um, you said it's status quo. You know there's going to be a change, but you guys are just taking your current model, and when the change comes, you'll just try and plug that model into whatever the change requires? Yeah, so the Solicitor General is telling us to, set to operate a status quo, um, which makes it difficult planning a year ahead. And we do have a contingency of a three-month salary in a GIC that we need to figure out what to do with it. And that's, you can see in our, um, in our books that that's what that sits there for. So then if we don't get our funding from the Solicitor General, we have money to pay staff. So in those areas, we have some decisions to make and um, hopefully we'll be going longer than we think and uh, we'll be able to, to make those decisions as we come. But until then, um, the funding, like we run at 150,000 from the Solicitor General, and we spend 260 a year just to manage basic needs and for. Our, our Sorry, my apologies. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay, thanks, Tina, for your presentation. Five minutes. Yeah, you still got ten to go. <laughs> Thanks, Tina. All right, so next we have the four Sitavoy Mum and Tots, and they are via Teams up on the screen here. You can go ahead, please introduce yourself first. Can you hear us? We want to make sure you guys can hear us. Can you try talk again so we can hear you? Us? Faintly. Barely. Is that, oh, is that us or is that them? Oh, it's them. Okay, here comes Jen. Can you guys try to. Are you close to your speaker? It's the same as here, I think. In the they're, they're moving. I think Jen's having them move over. Yeah, there they go. <laughs> Jen knows the hot spots up there, eh? This yeah. <laughs> yes. We're just sitting away and bumps and talks. Oh. Stand on a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, don't make it dangerous. Are you able to hear us now? Oh, yeah. there That's you better. go. Yeah. Oh, there's Dawn. That's better? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's just moving the video. Oh. There we go. Okay. Okay, so please introduce yourselves and uh, go ahead, please. Okay, so um, I'm Jenny Williams. Should we sound up? I feel like they can't really oh. see us. <laughs> no. um, I'm Jenny Williams, and I am the preschool, currently the preschool teacher at the Forest and Wayne Moms and Tots Preschool. I'm Kelsey Thompson, and I'm the secretary for the Moms and Tots. Okay, so I will begin by introducing the program. So I have been a part of the preschool program for about 10 years. Um, we provide a preschool program in our community for children ages two to five. Um, we run two days a week and we have a morning class and an afternoon class. Um, we currently have 28 registered students, which is our largest to date. It seems like every year we just get more and more kids. Um, we are currently the only program in Fort Assiniboine that um, provides a program for parents to drop their kids off. Um, we're not like a play group type program where parents are required to stay with their child. <clears throat> um, the community needs a place where children can play and learn with other children that are similar to their age. Um, it's important for children to also have access to early screening tools to catch those developmental delays that are sometimes present. 
Um, so our preschool program collaborates with Pemina Hills to access um, the PUF funding. So that is where our screening tools are coming from to um, screen those kids for the developmental delays. So if there are any delays, um, that's my word I'm looking for. If they, if they um, are screened for development delays and they have any delays that are found, um, the PUF program would then provide the support to those children during our program. Uh -huh. um, so I just want to go over our goals. So our goals as a program is to provide a fun and affordable program to foster and facilitate learning through play while building skills that they will use in kindergarten and to also build their confidence and their abilities as children. Um, we provide structured play-based activities where kids choose um, or have the choice based on their interests. And so activities include um, sand play, like a kitchen center, blocks, Play-Doh, light sensory type um, activities. Um, this is our first full year that we've been in the Fort Assiniboine Egg Society building. Um, so the benefits of that is we're also um, work alongside the Egg Society to improve the building. Um, it wasn't utilized very much prior to uh, us moving in. Um, so then some benefits to the students is we still are across the road from the school. So we're able to use um, the playground as well as go to the library and this year we have went skating so we're able to use um, the facility when it's available to us. Um, we also knew this year have increased to 1.5 um, staff so um, we currently have a uh, second staff member that supports our program in the morning class. She's the same person that supports our afternoon class, um, but her wage or salary is um, covered through the PUF program for the afternoon. Um, having said that, we are looking to increase two to two full-time staff starting next year. Um, we feel like our program has experienced enough growth that we are needing that second staff member to, um, for so many reasons, honestly, um, just to help support the class, help support the kids, and probably most importantly, to keep within ratio. Um, we fall underneath Alberta Children's Services, so we are a licensed preschool program. So we have all sorts of guidelines and rules and regulations that we have to meet through licensing. So, um, and then just to add to what Kelsey um, was talking about with being in the rec hall and um, collaborating with the Egg Society, um, we just currently finished a, reno a renovation project that was done as a partnership with the Egg Society. So we just um, put in a bathroom into our um, classroom space. So before the renovation, the kids were having to leave the classroom and go up into the curling lounge to use a bathroom, which was a bit of a safety concern because there's some kids that just prefer who they ask to aid them to the bathroom so there was times where I was having to leave the classroom um, which is definitely a bit of a safety concern so the egg society was great in partnering with us and upgrading our classroom to include a bathroom and we also um, in that same project are working on a storage room and hoping to 
continue to collaborate with the Egg Society to continue to improve the space. We're hoping that our next project can include some windows for that natural light that is very important for children um, and the classroom and the environment that the kids are in. So we do have lots of goals and um, I guess dreams that <laughs> we want for our classroom. I think that's all we have. Is there any questions? I have a couple uh, with regards to your revenue and expenses. Um, sorry, I just got to find it here. Uh, so it looks like uh, revenue, you guys get a government subsidy and then some of it's coming directly payment from the parents. How much would you charge for your guys' program and then how often is it running? I was looking through the documentation, but I didn't see that information in there. Yep, so we run from September to May and we charge a monthly fee of $40. So when I first started with the preschool, we were charging $75 a month um, and then that was kind of pre oil field uh, crash so then through that um, we were just finding that parents weren't were pulling their kids out due to not being able to afford that $75 so that was the time when we significantly dropped our fee to we actually dropped it to 35 at that time and then we've gone to 40 just because it's an easier number to work with um and then so this the student the subsidy that we receive right now is part of the government's affordability program that they have out right now so because we're a licensed preschool we fall underneath children's services so basically the same umbrella that you would find a daycare so we are receiving funding per child for fees so it is basically so what um happened was when we were receiving that funding or what when they put the program out we decided to because we had moved into our into the a society building and we were going to have extra expenses we decided we were going to cover our own rent Prior to uh, our move, that Woodlands County was paying thirty thousand dollars, I think, to cover our rent inside the school. So when we moved, we decided that we were going to attempt to cover our own rent and be a little bit more self-sufficient. Um, so we decided to, once the fees come out, we actually charged the parents one hundred and fifteen dollars, but they still only actually pay the forty. So we're comparable to preschool programs across Alberta cost-wise, but what the parents are actually paying is still just the $40. And how, sorry, and how many days a week and how many hours per day are the students there or the children? Okay, sorry. So they're two days a week and each class is four hours, three and a half. I can run up to four hours this year just because they're on the same day. It just, time-wise, I can only squeeze three and a half hours. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Is there any other comments or questions? I was just going to ask, on average, how many Puff Kids do you have within your program? If you were to yeah, average Yeah, um, so I would say on average we probably have five. Mostly speech and language development. Um, but I can honestly say since I've started, I haven't had a year without a, um, say this delicately, like a high needs, autism, that type of need. I've always had that some sort of support needed for a child on the spectrum. So that's a, that's a pretty, like it's one-on-one -on -one that, that support person is for that child during the time that he's in the program. That's why we're looking to increase to that second full-time staff because we're very grateful for the help and support we get through Puff, but sometimes that second person in the building is really not extra help to the whole class. They're just really one-on-one -on -one to one student. 
And with having the age range that we do, we can kind of predict how many students will be next year. So we're just kind of pre-planning um, so we know if a Puff kid is still going to enroll next year, what aids we'll need. One more quick question for me, please. Um, just on your expenditures, your fundraising expenditures are ten thousand. What what are you spending the ten thousand on for fundraising? Just it seems like a high number. So, I'm just wondering what it is. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I actually had in my notes that I was going to talk about our fundraising. We do six fundraisers throughout the year that make us over ten thousand dollars. So we do have a very um, active. Uh, fundraising committee and we have a lot of volunteer hours required by the parents to cover those fundraising hours um so all the the expenses that the fundraising helps to cover is classroom expenses so arts and supplies paper toy replacement toys get broken all the time so we're constantly replacing toys, um, like th like we started skating. So purchasing skates for kids that don't have um, just really any expense to just improve our program and create the best experience for every child that's there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so Northwest Central. Yep. Yep. We'll just introduce Northwest Central over to FASD. Parent Child Assistance Program, and they're also on Teams once. There she is. There she is. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Perfect. Oh. Yep. Go ahead. Um, I, I have a PowerPoint presentation. Is that something I'm able to share on the screen? Uh, no, because I'm sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. I know it off by heart. It's only four slides anyway. Um, so I'm Angela Kemble. I'm the executive director of Northwest Central Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Network, and that's not even the full title. Um, it's, it's a bit ridiculously long. Uh, we're just known as the FASD network for this area. We've been in your area since about 2010 and very grateful of the support that Woodlands County has provided us in the last few years. Um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about our PCAP program, which is our Parent and Child Assistance Program. It's a very well-known and um, highly researched and evaluated program based out of Seattle, Washington. It was adopted by Alberta uh, probably about 10 years ago. And through the adoption, they also ensured that it had a cultural sensitivity lens and just more recently, uh, a very strong 2S LGBTQ plus lens as well. Um, so originally the program was designed to serve pregnant women who are at risk of drug and alcohol impacted pregnancies. Now the program here in Alberta serves any individual who can is pregnant um, and, and is at risk of an alcohol or drug impacted pregnancy. That is a good model for the urban center. For the rural center, we actually, at the Northwest Central, expanded our parameters even more to include any individual who is pregnant or is at risk of becoming pregnant and may have issues with drugs and alcohol and be at risk for a drug and alcohol impacted birth. So that, um, if we limited our parameters, uh, we would have a very hard time getting a caseload and um, because it, with, with the way we're spread out in our region, it would be just a lot of windshield time getting from one client to another. That being said, Woodlands County is geographically very large. The clients that we serve uh, through this program are spread out. And I'd have to say that that area is one of the highest for our mileage, um, just because of the way the, the geographic region is designed. 
That being said, we have been able to expand this program in the area and serve up to 10 individuals. And when I say individuals, that includes families with uh, children and youth as well, and also their partners. And previous support for this program has allowed us to do that. Prior to that, we were only able to serve about half that amount. Our program was run very well during COVID. And in fact, our numbers increased during COVID. Uh, probably had a lot to do with, like say, the isolation and the inability to reach other services. Um, so we were still working as we always do, going at 100%. And the people that we brought onto our caseload during COVID have stayed with us. So um, we are now asking for uh, $5,000 to support the wage of the worker in the area to continue to provide that excellent support that we've been able to provide, in part thanks to you and your previous uh, grant donations. That is pretty much it for my spiel. Do I, does anybody have any questions for me? How much have we provided for you in the past? I don't think, I don't remember an application last year while I was on the board, so. Oh, there was one. <laughs> you guys are on my hit list every year, but um, I believe uh, last year, I, I want to say 2,500, but I can't recall off the top of my head. Mm, but I, I or, you know what? I, I, I can't reach um, my files because it's on the cloud and I would probably lose my access to you, but I can certainly get you that number. I can provide that, Angela. I think it was five, Thank you. wasn't it? Wasn't it 5,000? You, you know what? I think you're right, because I think originally it was 25, and then it got bumped up to five, and so I'm asking again for, for the five as well. So thank you, because it's been three years, if not four, that you guys have been supporting us. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you very much. You're so welcome. Have a great night. Thanks, Angela. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay, so the next one we have up is the Soaring Eagle Support Society, Outreach and Advocacy Staffing Support. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Sheila Watson and I'm the director of Soaring Eagle Support Society. And I'm never sure how much people know or don't know. First of all, I'm just really grateful to be able to present in person and for you to be able to hear a little bit about us before you make a decision on giving money away. I just really appreciate that opportunity. Um, so I'll just give you a, a really quick overview of what we do and then you could ask me some questions if you have you need to know more. So uh, as Soaring Eagle, we work with folks who are vulnerable, marginalized, and who struggle to find help within the traditional services that are around. Um, we're passionate about reducing the risk of uh, to those who are homeless, um, underhoused and hard to house by providing safe supported housing with a housing first focus. Um, we provide uh, services in two streams. One of them is supported transitional housing at Eagle's Nest Motel in White Court. Uh, in the past year, we've had uh, uh, over 60 individuals live uh, at, at Eagle's Nest. Currently, we have 28 residents. Um, we've housed anywhere between 22 and 32 people a month um, over the last year. That uh, average has in increased, and we've been sitting at uh, 28 for the last few months. Um, we turn away individually, individuals weekly uh, because of our lack of staffing uh, to be able to provide the comprehensive needs that some of these individuals might need um, and some of their more significant challenges. And we are not an emergency shelter either, so often we're turning people away that are coming to us suddenly that need help. Um, we have our, the RCMP will often um, refer people over to us. We're going, not an emergency shelter, but you know, there, there's very limited options for the hospital or for the RCMP. Um, it's, it's certainly an issue that I think our town and, and, and our county needs to address, that th there, is, there is no emergency support for people that, um, that need it. Um, the, our other stream is our outreach support program, and, um, and that's for people that aren't there to ac access the housing project specifically, but need other kinds of outreach supports. And um, 
<laughs> things like uh, doing their uh, taxes. We, we participate in the Alberta ID program. We're one of the only rural communities that do it. So we can help people get ID that struggle with getting ID. I don't think people understand how hard it is to get any kind of service. If you don't have ID, you can't get a bank account, you can't get um, uh, income supports, you can't go to the food bank, you can't do anything without ID. So uh, we help with that. We have a court support advocate um, and we help with income support applications and things like that. That program we basically had to suspend. Um, when we first started out, we we just went all gung-ho. We were just going to do everything for everybody. And um, the fortunate thing about COVID was that there was lots of grants around that because, because people were isolated and we were providing those kinds of supports. But those grants don't exist anymore. And so we've had to reduce our staff from nine to one and a half. And so our outreach program is just there um, on a very um, minor basis. And our uh, housing program, we're, we're just very cautious about who we can accept into the program uh, because we can't provide the comprehensive supports that we did when we had nine staff. So, um, we, we, there's also a, a seems to be a misinformation or an ignorance about who we serve and how. And that's something we would really like to clarify now and in the future. Homelessness has so many faces and our residents range from women who are leaving the women's shelter and uh, need a, a, a more um, ongoing place to stay. We have seniors waiting to get into the lodge. We have folks with chronic illnesses that can't maintain uh, an apartment at the kind of level that they would need to in the community. We have folks on age. We have people with cognitive challenges. We have those who are struggling with addictions and mental health issues. And uh, I'd just like to very quickly introduce you to one of our residents. This is a senior gentleman. He's been with us for about seven months. He has no addictions. Uh, we helped him uh, apply for his old age security and helped him through some court processes. And we did a, a little interview with some of our uh, residents just recently, and so I just want to read you this very quick interview. What led you to living here at Eagle's Nest? After a separation, I moved to another home, but it was not a good place for me to be. I met a lady that referred me to this place, Eagle's Nest. I've been there for seven months now. Where would you be if you, weren't, if you didn't live at Eagle's Nest? Most likely on the street or in a toxic house somewhere, making my problems worse. How would you like Cess Soaring Eagle to be known in the community? A good, loving place for the needy, a good place to get back on your feet, a good place for reflection. Anything else you would like to share with the community? They accepted me with open arms and today I have a smile and I'm happy to be alive and in a secure place. That's one of our residents, and it's really, I think, a reflection of many of our residents that we have at Soaring Eagle. Homelessness um, has many, many faces, and there's lots of reasons for people to be ha have a hard time finding housing that's appropriate for them. And supported housing is, is huge. Uh, <coughs> across the province, that's what we're talking about now. Not just housing, but supported housing, helping people maintain that housing and keep it on, and on the long term. Unfortunately, the reality is that we are extremely underfunded. There is no ongoing designated funding for homelessness in rural Alberta. Uh, and the funding that is available is extremely limited. This year, uh, rural Alberta received $2 million for two years. Uh, the rest of Alberta got $63 million, so we have 35% of the population and we got 3% of the funding. Um, and that includes everything from Banff to Cannells, anything except for the seven major cities got that $2 million. Uh, we did receive funding through that um, housing project. We received funding to, to pay for one staff member. And like that that's not even close to what we need to be able to operate. Uh, we depend on grants and fundraising through the community to exist. 
and we need the support of the county and the town of Whitecourt uh, partnering with us to help alleviate the struggle of homelessness. The cost we have of providing housing for a person is approximately $15,000 a year, and that's with our full support program. Um, the average cost of housing or of supporting a person who is unhoused is about $15,000 a month that is costing the rest of us. So I, I think that uh, I think that we do a, a fiscally responsible job as well as just looking after the needs of people. So the, the, the funds that we are asking for is to supplement the incomes for support staff. Okay, is there any comments on questions? Go ahead. Um, so a comment, I guess, especially to anybody that might be listening, um, <clears throat> that disparity of 3% for rural Alberta is what municipalities around this province are dealing with, on not just on this mm -hmm. level, um, but uh, again, if anybody's listening. <laughs> I, I yeah. wanted to um, just go through your uh, income statement and your balance sheet. There's a couple things that... Uh, jumped out at me. Um, so start with uh, the uh, statement of financial position. There's a tremendous difference in cash year over year. Is, is that account on account of uh, a lack of grant funding? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm cash. A, tr a tremendous difference in cash, um, cash holdings that in 2021, maybe, yeah, you're probably not. I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't bring it with me and I, yeah. I always know I should, sure. right? So I'm looking, page two of the financial report. Okay. Um, so it's the statement of financial position. Okay. Um, so in 2021, your cash was 106 and, and in 22 it was uh, 24. And I'm just wondering if that uh, um, is a reflection of the reduced grant funding? Yes. Yeah, okay. And so then I just want to scroll down um, to page six. Mm -hmm. And in 2021, um, you can see a series of grant uh, that yes. show up as revenue, and then next year, none of them are there. So th this is what you're saying is that exactly. you're the Alberta Health Services Mental Health Grant, we thought, like they even said, we have this extra money, would you like to ex extend your program? Absolutely. And we were really um, positive, like, you know, thinking that we would be able to re receive that grant, which paid for two two positions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, did not. So, and so it absolutely correct, all those grants are just not available. Okay. Yeah, that's it, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> sure. Um, so Sheila, when did you go down f or go from nine staff members to one and a half? Is that this year? September. September, okay. September, and and our challenge was that we were anticipating grants and we were trying to just push forward and um, you know continue to operate at full uh, speed and and we d we shouldn't we can't we can't and so you know it it put us in a in a, a negative position at that point in time and and therefore the whole need to reduce our staff and reduce our programming. And um, I, I just like, wanna say that we're very pleasantly uh, pleased at how well our residents have stepped up and taken ownership of where they live and uh, realizing that they're, like we have conditions on living there that you don't have in any other rental situation. And they're just being very uh, accommodating and we've had very, very few challenges uh, we were expecting more are, are you still uh renting the property or do you guys own it now no we rent rent it right. yeah there yeah. again the, the getting the grant funding for that we're very new and so <coughs> our sustainability is not this you know we have no way of, of proving a sustainability and there's no provincial grant so federal money wants to come with provincial money to sustain you and there isn't any and just one last question. Were you able to get any grant funding from the town of Whitecourt? No. No, we're not zoned for the town of Whitecourt to prove the, the way they would like us to be zoned. And so, so we don't qualify for grants for them. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Okay, anything further from anybody? Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay, so we have one final one, the Whiteboard Indigenous Friends Society. It's the Cultural Awareness Training. Okay. Please introduce yourself. I'm, I'm Faye Mishnick, and I'm the president of the White Court Indigenous Friends Society. And when we get a friendship center, I'm changing it to start with letter A. <laughs> and I brought my colleague, um, he's on a board member, John Ives, with me, for moral support. <laughs> Anyways, we're applying for funding for a cultural awareness training. Um, our society is only a year and a half, about a year and a half years old. Um, we're not a friendship society yet. You have to be a, uh, a friendship center, I should say. You have to be a society for two years before you can make application to be a friendship center. And thus you can't get all the grants and funding from that you could get from a, when you went to a friendship center. So in the meantime, we've been putting on uh, workshops and um, stuff like that in order to educate and raise awareness about uh, truth and reconciliation and all that stuff, intergenerational trauma and stuff. And how this started was um, Michelle Jones at Community Futures. She approached me and asked if we do this type of stuff, this kind of cultural awareness. And I said, we don't, but I know someone who does that facilitates it. And I said, hey, who's it for? And she said, for her board. And I said, hey, I have an idea. How about if we get together and we expand it? so that we can offer it to people such as like town councils, county council, um, service providers, and have a couple sessions. And she was all for that idea, and so we have a facilitator, and yeah, we just want to expand it to include uh, everyone around the community and uh, surrounding area without, like, you know, without charging anyone, and, um, and provide lunch and snacks and things like that. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any comments, questions? Well, um, I I uh, I can't tell you how much I support what you guys are doing and and uh, and the initiative that uh, Canadians as a, as a whole that, um, are undertaking uh, the awareness that I like to think Canadians as, as a whole are, are uh, starting to uh, come to understand. Um, so this information, uh, in my eyes, is um, not only long overdue, but um, more is better. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to share a personal story. Um, <clears throat> two years ago, when you guys had your inaugural Truth and Reconciliation, uh, National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, there was a member of my family who... Um, didn't really understand intergenerational trauma, mm -hmm. and I uh, coaxed this person to come with me to the uh, to the initial ceremony. And, and the elder that spoke rendered this family member to tears. Um, and for me, that was uh, a, a real real time uh, realization for me of here's somebody that I've been close to all my life. I thought I understood, and this person certainly didn't have that level of understanding. And Canadians as a whole um, are, uh, are due that awakening. So I, I support you guys. Thank you. I just wanted to mention we had a, a blanket ceremony, at a, or sorry, an exercise. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. It's like Kairos a blanket exercise, and we put that on for free. And we had about 40 people, service providers around our area show up. And I was quite surprised at the amount of people that showed up, and it was very emotional and very, it was awesome. I couldn't believe the turnout. And we we were approached to like, you know, put it on again, put it on again. And so that's what our aim is, is to, to educate and raise awareness and without a cost to the public. So. Good job, Good job. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Take some cookies. Take some cookies. Heather says, take some cookies. Yeah. Oh, yeah.
<laughs> okay, so that uh, ends our delegations, and we're going to uh, just give a minute for our cookies. <laughs> the cookie break, apparently. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> oh, well, they're stamped. Dave. <laughs> 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 They're good, hey? I ate all mine already. They gave me, they gave me a bin for Christmas. I ate them in three days. All right, so while you guys are having a cookie break, we're going to move on to new business uh, 5.1, which is a community service project update for February and March. I tried to include March. That's kind of March? Yeah. Part way through March? Because we didn't meet in February. Um, other than what's in there, I just I won't read the whole thing, but our needs assessment, um, he's been doing some additional stakeholder interviews, talking to service providers. They're mapping um, where people are going, so we're still working on that. Uh, Dr. Kent and Travis met with council at their meeting uh, March 1st, just to discuss some things that, that came out of their findings. That was nice to meet him. Um, so for programming, on the programming front, uh, we're just, I'm working on a poster right now for a firearm safety course. We're offering this in Anselmo. We want to do one down here and one up in the fort. So those are the dates, May 13th in the fort and May 27th in Anselmo. On my fort one, I haven't even put a poster out and I've probably got about 13 people. Wow. I was talking with Louise Ralston, usually runs that course and she's been getting people asking. So she's been taking a list and then once we're taking registrations, that, that's gonna fill up really fast. And I guess it's very timely because May is when people wanna take their firearms courses and I didn't know this, but his name's Dan Johnston. I think there's a T in there. And he travels all over. He's done this in Athabasca, Edson, Yellowhead. He's pretty extensive in this area, he's down in Wetaskiwin. So, we're being, we're not really partners on this, but we are partners, if that makes sense. We're collecting registrations and he's charging us 130 and then we're charging 150. So that $20 is gonna offset the cost of the rent for the, we're not making money, which we can't do, but we're not subsidizing much either. Um, it's an all day course, if you're interested. And I've been talking with a few potential vendors um, for Family Fun Day. I, I think I miss, somebody misunderstood me with the vendor thing. Um, I can't remember which one asked, but they're not really vendors. They're not selling anything. They're just booths that we have at Family Fun Day. Rebecca, have you ever come to Family Fun Day? I don't know. Oh, well, you're coming this year. What's the date again? Uh, sorry, uh, July 15th, third Saturday. I can send out an invite if you'd like. So you have it in your calendars. Um, it's fun. Alberta Watershed, or Athabasca Watershed might be coming back. They were there, the, the, the last one we had pre-COVID, and they're interested in coming back. So a lot of educational, and I'm gonna, I was telling Joan about this, we're gonna get some street performers, like people that would walk around and just do like little juggling and stuff with the kids. We're still gonna have our mascot. He is such a hit. Last year he was Olaf, and no, he was Marshall last year. And he was a big hit. So I'm just working on Family Fun Day. Want to get as much as we can do with that one. And volunteer appreciation. So I can give you a better update with this. Um, I've already, this morning, I was, oh yes. Sorry to interject. So that was me that had asked. Oh, that was you. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, and my only mindset there wasn't to have them to come and set up food trucks or something. But to see if anybody, any of the local businesses wanted to donate things to the Family Fun Day, um, and which would essentially be free advertising, which is what my mindset was. Like, maybe somebody um, wanted to donate, we got a bouncy castle that they want to donate for the kids or something like that. That was the mindset behind it. Okay. And I never followed up on the email. No, you didn't. Because I totally forgot about it, and <laughs> you okay. just mentioned it now. <laughs> okay. So that was my, that's what I was thinking. Well, we, we can talk to West Fraser even if they'd like to sponsor something. They, I can give you a little bit, sorry, I'm bouncing a little bit all over the place. West Fraser approached us and said, I have money we want to give to you. And they want to do something out at Blue Ridge. So no, you don't want it. No, 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 Andre no, 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 and I no, 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 were no, no, no. like, what? <laughs> so 
basically they have eighty thousand dollars that they were giving without in the community. That's not all for us, by the way, because right away I was like, I can spend your eighty thousand. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so they're giving it in different areas. But I said, well, how much are you going to give us? And he said, well, how much do you want? So Andre and I kind of talked back and forth, and we remembered. And Tracy, you might remember this back in the day that we've always had people that have come to Blue Ridge Family Fund Day when we have their little survey that said, I wish you had a shade shelter. Mm -hmm. So boom, we're gonna ask them for a shade shelter. They wanna put their name on it. It's not 100% the works yet, but if that's something they'll go for, if anything, we're gonna get another park bench or some kind of shelter. We just, we're gonna, we're gonna go big and give them options all the way down. So, so West Fraser might be in on a bouncy council, Bouncy Castle, we've never gone externally for that before. We've always been encouraged to not ask for sponsorship for events. Long time CAO. I agree with that. But, yeah. but we can, hey, they're, they're, they're not here, and we can do what we kind of want. So I can, I can definitely, if you guys want to do that, mm -hmm. I can ask I around. We should. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe we should ask somebody for, like, a portable generator. <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, so they told me I'm actually not allowed to have a generator because things get stolen with our events. But I was thinking instead of putting him out on the street, we might have him in the parking lot. So at least we can watch him and we'll just have some better signage. But Alberta Transportation doesn't like us to be too much on the highway. So we'll just have to have better signage. But yeah, I'm not allowed that generator on the street. They, they got some. I replaced it and they still were like, no, we can't have it there. If you're watching, Mark. That's embarrassing. Um, it was. But anyway, so for volunteer appreciation, uh, we're looking at, uh, we had three nominations already just this morning. It kind of made my day. They were my first. I know it's pretty sad that that can get you excited and make your whole day, but it did. And I can tell you, Jenna's already knows about it, but Jenna was nominated twice from her community. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And we got an entertainer. It's called Velvet Hand. They are a kind of like a cover band, and they're going to do a songs because we're a our event is multi generational. They're going to do a decades of music, so I, everybody's going to get a little taste. So you have Queen there, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> I don't even and know who the uh, other guys were. <laughs> Wayne Sharkey mentioned him, but uh, from Merthorpe, his name is Edward Pym. It's the young gentleman he was talking about. I reached out. Joan and I at the same time actually saw him on Facebook and went. We should ask him. So I reached out. He's going to do a few songs for us because he's a local kid. Nice. And so after we do a little opening ceremonies and right before supper, he's going to play for about 20 minutes or so. He doesn't have a big set yet. Um, and he only wanted $100. And so I said, uh, no, no, we're going to give you more. And so his, his teacher manager, Wendy um, Scott, is her and her husband, he, as moral support, they're going to come, but they're going to play. The three of them are going to play through supper. Because we didn't want to just have Edward play through supper because then people ignore, mm -hmm. right? So we're going to showcase the boy, and then they're just going to play with their nice. piano and music at supper, and then we'll do our awards, and then we're going to dance the night away with Velvet Hand. So I'm just working on some little details and some other things that, that I guess it doesn't matter right now, but I've, only ha I've invited the MLA, both of them. I didn't go with the MP. Sorry, we went with the MLAs, they're local. And so Martin Long's coming. I haven't heard back from um, that guy. <laughs> Sorry. We'll see him at the RMA. We'll plug him. Yeah, give him a plug. So, so far, that's where we're at. So that will be April 22nd? April 22nd. Corinne sent it out to you, Council. And you should all have it in your calendars. If you don't, let me know when I can send you an invite. I don't think I do. Okay, so April 22nd. Nominations go until the 7th of April, and then they're going to come to your meeting. This is going to be, we're going to need a quorum for that one. And then the minute you decide on who gets it, I got to call and get the names engraved. So it'll be bada boom, bada bing, but it's going to be fast. So what we're basically looking at, I don't have a whole itinerary yet. We'll go over that at the next meeting, but I'll need somebody to work the table, work the room, we're going to have little prizes and giveaways and such like that, so. Um, Location? Westward Community Center. They're the largest that can accommodate. We're, I'm anticipating about 400, 450 people. It's so it's, we needed the bigger center. Uh, I can mention that there was a few seniors that wanted, but not over here, because it's always here, but this is where our population is. But 
it's the largest venue it's to keep it locally i looked at options in barhead i looked at options that even <laughs> i just said to joan i'm crazy here but let's bust everybody to edmonton like do something like jubilations entertainment everything's there food right no that was way over my budget yeah. <laughs> so we're just gonna stay with what we've done but like, you know what we kick great. it up a notch but right you always do an awesome job oh, thank you. this you is do. my first no this is my first one well it's, it's always been like corinne who but else? you've always Sherry, been there to help Sherry. yes yeah. yeah yeah but this is my first one so i'm a little nervous but okay. it'll be great i'll have great more details job. for you soon but no it's going to be a good party the low income benefits program uh in your packages i showed you kind of examples nikita rocked this little insert that we have this is not i didn't print properly but <laughs> so there was a was thin little insert that Makita cut in the little threes there, and then we stuck it in all the utility bills. And we decided we are going to do that the rest of the time, didn't we? So <coughs> utility bills it went into. Uh, Mayor Burroughs, or sorry, Reeve Burroughs was on the radio. I don't know if you heard him. And then we have radio ads like crazy, which is good. A lot of staff have heard them, so that was good to hear. Um, seniors transportation grants that we processed them in January. So when I sent them their check, I sent, this is an attached letter that an example, so they know. I've talked to several of them on the phone. Uh, only one really, I think our little angry man was it. I haven't is had, right? yeah, right. I haven't had, I've had people say why, and so I tell them, they go, oh, okay. I had one gentleman that had uh, contacted Councillor Dean, and he doesn't think anybody could live on 17, like the number that's in there for the Lycos, but. 14. It's, no, it's for it's seventeen for two, I think. Yeah, seventeen for right? two. Right, but so far that's it. One person and. So, um, if sorry. I clear, yeah, so sorry. that that gentleman called you. And yeah. You, okay. Yeah. So. <clears throat> gets it. Sure. He was mad at the front. Um, we also had on the other side was the, uh, kind of like an article that we put in the express. We're gonna run it again. Uh, what else did we do? I think that was it for, for that one. Uh, yeah, regional papers, transportation grants, social, oh, we're on Facebook. Nikita's going to do that right away. Um, I've also sent it to our FCSS partners in Marathorpe and Barhead who are spreading the word there. I think I need to connect with the seniors circle here in White Court because there's a lot of our seniors there. Get a poster or something up. But word is spreading, which is good. Uh, operating grants. So, because this was for our meeting in February, I've got all of them. We're going to be, once these FCSS grants are done, we're going to start processing those. They're not coming to you guys because operating grants have never really come to you. We have the policy, we have maximum amounts that they can apply for. They either get that, so we've budgeted for the max. They'll either hit the max or they'll be below it. I don't anticipate a lot of them actually hitting the max. So, we'll see. With those, uh, I'm still reviewing the care policy. Got a lot, kind of went, sorry, to the bottom of my pile right now. But I do have a suggestion, and then we'll talk about that when it comes to you. But instead of calling it care, how about like youth recreation and culture grant? Because that's what it's for. It's not just recreation. But let your brains kind of stew a little bit. When I come back, we'll, we'll pick on a name. But that's kind of what I was suggesting. And FCSS grants, we just did. I made a couple notes. Um, it doesn't matter to you guys, but I'm taking a NACLA course through the U of A, so I'm working on my level one for NACLA. So that's fun. <laughs> I think I don't know what that is. Oh, you don't know what it's a wrestling move. Yeah, it's like can, you, can I demonstrate on you, Joe? Sure. Um, no, it's the local government authorities through the U of A, so it's all about local government administration. So most administrators have like level one or managers are level two, I think. I don't know where council sits on that, if anybody's taken any courses, but you need to, you I've, need to I've take I've heard those. of it, I, just, I didn't know what the acronym yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's so no courses. Tina's I'm, taken a few, I'm, I'm, what are you at? Number seven of eight courses, so yeah. that'll be done right away. I was taking it with, with Kara Kennedy, but she dropped out, so I'm on my own. Actually, I think Corinne's taking the one Corinne's I'm taking right now. Yeah. Uh, what else was I going to tell you? Oh, that was everything. Yep, I think that was everything for my report. What we're going into. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Now. 
No questions. I was just going to make a motion to accept the uh, project update as information. Okay. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much, Heather. Okay, so now we're going to move into 5.2, which is the FCSS grant applications. Um, how do we want to do this? Do we want to talk about each one separately and, and then just make one motion at the end? Is that cool? Okay. Okay, so then we'll speak to the first one, which is the play group, the Blue Ridge Community League. Anybody have any comments or anything about that one? I think it's great. I think the program's great and they're really growing it and I think it's awesome for that area. Yeah, and as a, someone in schools and just familiar with the, the junior kindergarten programming, what we're seeing when she spoke to the needs, like it mm -hmm. is significant with with young kids and we know part of it is due to COVID and the, the lack of socializing and all those pieces so good on them for offering yep. the program to that in that community so. okay awesome so then we'll go to the golden agers asking for 4400 um, keeping the music alive in the Ridge area He's passionate, and and I apologize for the for as I mentioned in my email. I apologize for the application. It was the best that we could do, but I wanted to keep his the authentic that yep. he wrote in there. Mm -hmm. But we needed to massage it a little bit, so we were on the phone probably half an hour or so, and and got it to where we need to be so that they can get this funding. But normally, you wouldn't get a messy one like that. So, I mean, this is gonna. It, only because it's going to affect one later on I want to talk about, but um, it just, he, like he was originally asking for about six twenty three hundred or 2700 and we, and with the adjustments that you made, it was 4400 but it's mostly around $2,000 for people that would be volunteering to do the music for the event, I, I believe. Well, they were, the 2000 was to hire somebody. They wanted to hire like a, not somebody that just stands and does the banjo. They, they wanted to hire like a, a band and that's the 2000 would cost them that. So that's when we were, once I talked to him, I said, okay, so 20, his original ask was 27, but yeah, 2730, but he wanted to hire a band. I said, well, what, where are you going to get the money? So that's why we massaged it. We massaged it, so it's a little bit more than his original ask, but it's that's what they kind of wanted. Yeah, I guess I guess the only question is there they have forty three hundred dollars on hand, but it looks like we're subsidizing the entire thing. Yeah, yeah so that the, he wanted to keep that money as, as like seed money. It no, I I under like I agree he had a lot of energy and he's very passionate about it but I I mean we've got community groups here that have known have, have known value they give into the community that we're giving less money to than than a gentleman that's essentially doesn't know exactly what he even wants to do right now he just is asking for forty four hundred dollars I, I think in this case we should ask him to start a little small and see what kind of success he can have with an event. By I, I definitely we should give some grant funding for it, but I don't know if forty four hundred dollars is necessary for uh, a group that they don't even really know what they want to do with it yet. I think the group sense. knows. It's just he's learning. You know, like he's like he just become president, right? And so I think like they've had a well established seniors group for quite a long time. And then COVID. And then COVID hit. Okay. And I think it's Dwayne stepped into this role maybe because there wasn't someone else that wanted to do it. Uh, but I think they're a very, very active group. And prior to COVID, they got together all the time. They were self-sustained. They didn't come to us for any amount of, like no big money, right? Like they were, if they went to Jubilations or Mayfield or whatever, they paid for that. Like they weren't asking us for that kind of money where the other senior groups have asked us for that kind of money in the past. So I think maybe just being a little rough around the edges and learning, it was maybe some of the presentation, but I mean, that's totally up to the group, right? Yeah, I don't have much history with it, so I don't. I, I've known him for years because he worked at the mill for years, sure. but. Previously, they've had they've asked for like a thousand or yeah, very minimal two thousand. So, 
Oh, sorry, I'm, That's go okay. ahead. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that, that I think that is uh, maybe a little unique to this group is, you know, rather than going to the music, they're bringing the music here and they're really, you know, that comment really resonated to me when he said, you know, that he wants people from Fort Assiniboine and, and White Court to come there. And, and wouldn't it be cool mm -hmm. if that became the place where seniors go, oh yeah, you know, Blue Ridge is a place to go for, for to listen to artists. Yeah, on Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Was it? Yeah, Queen. Yeah. And Jim Reeves, don't forget about Jim Reeves. They, they have Queen, I'll be going. <laughs> and then younger. As Tracy, Tracy mentioned, they were a really active group for years and just going gangbusters, like you said, like 60 people. Yeah. And they've been struggling. Uh, Edna Jackson stepped down. She was huge. Very There's about three of them that were doing a lot of it, especially fundraising the community for the community league. And Edna just mm -hmm. stepped back for a lot of reasons. And then it just sat there. And then COVID hit and it still just hummed. And now Dwayne's just decided we're, so like you said, they've got people coming, they got them going. He's the, the main thing that I can tell you that is good that has come out of this, no matter what you decide, is he originally didn't have the Blue Ridge Community League working with him. He applied on his own. And when I called him, I said, you know, Dwayne, I appreciate your passion, but you are not in corporate society. I can't give money to an individual, provincial funding, blah, blah, blah. So, well, then how do I get? So we're, this is He's our project. By December 31st, we're going to have, so I said I'd work with him and help him, and we're going to get him incorporated. So they're already getting a little bored. They're, he's the president. They're going to get so, yeah, we're going to get him going. Okay. And then they want to be self-sufficient. So I think that's what he wants that seed money for to, to keep it. That's understandable. Yeah. And it's not a lot of money. No. Really. No. It's and maybe just the wording is function. Like I thought maybe they were thanking. Who are they thanking? Like the thank you was confusing. Just. Yeah. I, I think it makes sense now. Yeah. I mean, just. If they were asked, my worry was that it was, they were going to ask a bunch of artists to volunteer to play, and then that two thousand dollars was going to pay. Like you know what I mean? And yeah. Like, a gratuity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's going to come out and that's coming out of Woodlands County's pocket essentially, which is I have no problem with that. But if they're looking to actually hire yes. community members to do it, that makes more sense than asking them to volunteer and then have an unknown amount of gratuity they're going to receive from that. No, this was to pay for that. Yeah. Okay, so then the presentation with the community lunchbox, which was for $1,500 for the volunteer recruitment and retention. Any comments or questions? We want to discuss that. I, I enjoyed, I think that the passion behind Bridget's presentation was really good, and um, just the, we all know what we're like when we're hungry, so I, I appreciate the fact that it's inclusive to me. Yeah, we have. We have 30 lunches on Monday and 30 dropped off on Wednesday, wow. and they're gone. Uh, so there's not leftovers days. either. No, there's no leftovers. You know, by Wednesday, all the like the Monday, Tuesday, and part of Wednesday lunches, like they're gone. The ones that were dropped off on Monday, and then from Wednesday to Friday, like there's never lunches at the end. Of the week. So they're asking for the funds to help, you know, appreciate the volunteers, basically, right? Mm -hmm. I was a little bit surprised when she had said, because last year, wasn't it for computers they asked for? Was it computers? And then she said they put on the volunteer lunch that Woodlands No, it was volunteers last year because oh, we, year that's them. what they would basically qualify. Equipment doesn't qualify for FCSS. Oh, okay. Okay. Not the kind of equipment they wanted. Mm -hmm. And they did qualify they for a volunteer retention. Okay. Yeah, you know, okay. yeah. sorry. It's, I can give you because I'm still learning with this FCSS, if you'd like, I can include in your packages um, what we've given previously. You've done that before. I think I did one you of my first ones one and then it just... And it said what they asked for, what okay. we gave them. It's just kind of a reference point. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. Go ahead. So I'm taking a few courses through Gateway Academy right now and they're a huge supporter like of bringing food to that school. and. I've just been able to like kind of see the impact they they brought there. There's a lot of kids that just they can't, and it uh, it brings food to those those kids. Sure. Good. 
Okay. That's what you want to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that, you know, Dave, your comments and that, that's what we need to hear because we're not on the front lines. You guys are. Mm -hmm. So to see and hear what the impacts are, it's really doing is very important. For me. Yeah, and even besides the lunch. For me. Yeah, and even besides the lunches. Uh, you know, there's granola, bananas, there's apples, and like all of that is gone yeah. every week. Yeah. Right? So with that being said, the recommendation is half of what their ask is. Well, and partly because of the amount of Woodlands County, so they're 100% of their ask, but they're only, they don't know how many they're serving. Yes, we have Woodlands County st students in the schools, so that was kind of the rationale for the recommendation is we're, if, if half of their kids are Woodlands County, well then we give them half. That, and this is and just a recommendation. A time. Yeah, we usually give them <coughs> both that. Okay. But but that's not my call. So has the town given them? Do we know? Like they give them twenty five hundred dollars last yeah. year, right? <laughs> no, yeah, I don't it, know. It thinks it, it's in here that they give them twenty five hundred dollars for a van or something. Yes, I, I don't know that. if they go through yeah. FCSS. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But the town previously they've given about the equivalent of what we do, mm -hmm. so it's not very much. Yeah. But I can't answer that completely. More thoughts? No. No. But I think everybody here supports the program. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I have no problem with that level of funding. Mm -hmm. and the rationale makes sense. You know, I kind of forgot the history, but that makes sense. But, uh, it's it's on a racial basis, sort of. <clears throat> sort of. Yeah. <laughs> if you use the ratio, it would be a quarter, right? But, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the Eagle Tower Victim Services, volunteer advocate training, I won't speak to it. Do we well, want me to leave? They don't deserve anything. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? Or Historically, from my point of view, we've kind of come up with this number that we've done for the last several years. And when they've done a presentation two years ago, I think, they did, and like, it was just eye-opening for me, not knowing what their whole task was. Mm -hmm. And it, it's awesome. It's so, awesome, Tina. It's special people for that. Just procedurally, like, we'll have to approve all the other ones Except with you, and then yeah, you'll have yeah, to yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I can leave if you guys want to talk about, like, I'm... Uh, See, I'm which, so. which training do they do? Like, you're, is it, like, mental health first aid? Is it... So we have a 32-module training course that the Solicitor General has online that okay. before anybody even gets... Um, as they're doing their security clearance, they're doing that training. Yeah. So when their the security clearance comes through about six months, they're done that. And then the training is all hands-on after that. And unfortunately, we have to wait for bad things to happen to train people. So um, it's as much as their availability is, as we can get them going on their own kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it takes about two years before an advocate can go on a call with another person that isn't fully trained. Okay, so we're good there. So, Fort Assiniboine Mums and Tots, the $15,000 for the preschool. So I did, I mean, obviously we want to, I, sorry, I didn't raise my hand, but um, oh, that's fine. I, I do think we want to support this group. I did, one of the questions that they didn't answer well that, I, I don't want to say is troubling, but I just, after mulling it over, I didn't necessarily think they answered it very well. And that was with the $10,000 in costs for yeah. for fundraising. The items that they said were fundraising costs were not fundraising costs. So it was a bit, I don't want to use the word troublesome, it's not, but I just... A little lack of transparency. Yeah, there was a little yeah. lack of transparency there. And it seems like $10,000 for fundraising to raise $25,000 is... Kind of a so weird we number asked to me. this question last year. I asked it last time, and they did have a breakdown. There wasn't a breakdown this time. And and what I remember about that breakdown breakdown is that it made sense. Like, do you guys re recall that? I, I barely do. But um, with regards to this grant, every year we've given the same amount, right? And it's because the direction we've gotten from council before yeah. is this is the amount we're giving. So yeah. There well, it is. <laughs> and the, the other thing is that in years past, um, Woodlands County paid that rent to the school board. 
and it was more than 15,000. 30, 30, 30. Yeah. So, so we gave them 45 total. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I, and again, coming back to, I hear what you're saying, Jeremy, and I, and I looked at that again, and I'm like, I remember asking this last year. How, how come it's there again? But it, uh, when they broke it down, help me out, you guys. It was, um, they were, um, so they were having hot dogs and, and various things. So part of that 10000 was built into the cost mm -hmm. of the actual product that they were selling for you know, to make a, a modest profit. It, it made sense when, yeah. when they had it broken So you're spending 10 to make 20. Yeah, kind of. yeah, yeah, that's exactly the, the premise. <clears throat> I did like the ingenuity of like how they've navigated, you know, where they are situated now and mm -hmm. now they can go skating. You can utilize other facilities that are yeah. close. Um, that part I was mm -hmm. impressed with. And I like the nimbleness, you know, they, they recognized that <clears throat> the kids were suffering because their parents couldn't afford it. So, like, yeah. let's let's make sure those kids get the program they deserve and need. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, they, they were able to react to that and, and put on, you know, a very good program. And really $40 a month, yeah. you know, to be able to get your kid introduced into the education system is pretty good. Yeah. And the socialization aspect, too. If you look on their financial statements, it's the last page in their application, they do mention um, for fundraising expenses, they have winter and spring flowers and raffle license. So I'm sure that that was part of the cost. Yeah, the flowers, that's right. Yeah. The flowers were expensive to buy. Yeah, yeah that's what they have in there. Yeah. I'm not sure what they're doing this year for fundraising. That This is based on their last year's financials. The Northwest Central FASD Parent Child Assistance, they're asking for 5000 I don't. I mean, yeah, we, that's what we've been giving them forever. I just want to note that in their financials, like they have over half a million dollars in cash on hand. Do they really need this grant funding from us? I think part of the reason, I can't speak for that, but when I did ask her about that, this person is now working specific there's 10 100 percent of this money is going to service woodlands county i think that's why they're kind of putting that asking for that five thousand because it, she mentioned it does cover mileage but this person is going in the fort assiniboine area i think she's even going into goose that's 100 percent us like woodlands county so i think that's why they're asking for that because it's they're huge i mean when she says they're northwest central like their their area is massive but I can't speak to what, what, with the revenue in the bank. Well, you know, if we if we start getting into that, you know, we really have to be careful because if we start looking at community lunchbox program, you know, and really looking at their financials and their assets and their, you know, it's kind of the same thing. You either decide we're going to support them or we're not. So. Oh, for sure. I just, yeah. I mean. Same thing. But oh no! We're, we're giving community lunchbox half their ask as well, right? Yeah. So, I I just sometimes I just wonder on the rationale and the recommendations. I'm not questioning them. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. what the rationale is. And coming back, the reason it's at fifty percent for the lunchbox is based on that ratio of uh, county residents mm -hmm. within the school system. Mm -hmm. You do in your RFD. You can you notice at the bottom. I did say there is a surplus after that with you. Yeah. So you can you have that. I don't want to go over that, but if you want to adjust some of these recommendations, that's how much you have to play with. So if we don't use it, we lose it. No, no, no it this. can go to volunteer appreciation. Okay. So I can spend a little oh, bit more on that, that because that's yeah. that's an FCSS program that's directly. <laughs> What was that? Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> no. But you, it, it can go, that's the money that we've budgeted. Yeah. In, in all my recommendations, you can see the money that was budgeted for those groups. So it can play in there as long as we, at the end, we hit that. I think it's 50000 total. Yeah, I think I so. just want to note that you have White Ridge's friends at 4400 on the recommendation, recommended actions, but they're only asking for 2275 or 2250 two yeah the number if you correct it to the what their ask is gets to the total oh, recommended but right. yes i think you copy and paste the blue ridge maybe 
<laughs> yeah, I was looking. I added up those numbers about ten times. I'm like, mm. yeah, go go on go on the RFD. Well, I I trusted you, Heather. I didn't add them up. <laughs> <laughs> so do we need to correct the? Well, when we get down there. Yeah. Right? Okay. We'll talk about that. Okay. So soaring. Is that everything about that? Just clean that up. Okay. So soaring Eagle Support Society. Their outreach and advocacy staffing. For twenty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. My question or comment I have about that is, she had said that the town will not support them, but no. isn't there their it's guidelines? Where located. So where they're located? But aren't they in town? Yeah, but but that area of town is not zoned for the type of operation they are. So they're operating, and they're being allowed to operate, but. They don't qualify for funding because they're not in the, the right zone. That's like commercial, you know. It's Having over commercial. in Motel really? Row, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I believe I, I know what facility they use, but oh, okay, because I'm thinking they're also FCS is like why? Yeah. What's the difference with their yeah. guidelines versus ours? That's my understanding. Commercial zoning. They support the the town supports it in principle, but they just don't support the location. Okay. Have you heard anything different? No, I, I haven't heard anything I've ever heard yeah. that. Well, and again, the recommendation that I have is based on the Woodlands County people they serve. They have 100 and they serve uh, 10, uh, they okay. said. So yeah. you're asking for $10,000, but you, that's for... Gotcha. So. I was wondering why it was so different from their ask. Okay, that makes sense. And you sense. can increase it again. You've got that five-something thousand surplus that could go for volunteer oh, appreciation. Oh. To your appreciation lady all over us, right? <laughs> Keep your <Yeah>. money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the coordinator. So for my my end, I would like if we could increase it a bit. I mean, this is, it, we know homelessness in our area is a problem if it and completely unaddressed right now. There's very very little funding for them. They're running like, now again on an even more shoestring budget than they ever were before, and if we. If that if that facility shuts down, that is forty five people who will now be living either homelessly in Woodlands County or homeless in Whitecourt, and they they they're not asking for ten thousand dollars or five thousand dollars with an excess amount of money in the bank. They have nothing. Like they'll be running at a hundred and fifteen thousand dollar deficit this year. I, I really they're going to really struggle to make it through another year, in my opinion. They'll, if they can't find additional funding. Yeah. Sustainability is not there for them. That is, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah, they were depending on grants, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what would your recommendation be, Jerry? I don't know. What's, I would like to go to five if we could. I mean, it might be a drop in the bucket for them, but it might not. Well, I think they'd take anything to give them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think we only, we gave them two thousand last year. I but I'm open that. to discussion. I do, yeah. you know, I do understand it's a tough. This one's a tough one. Well, and it kind of falls in line with that ratio with respect to the lunchbox. Mm -hmm. We got 50, 50, 50. It, you know what? Got an election looming, right? There's, there's so many. We, we look at these applications. We get a good understanding of what these people do in our community. Your organization is being changed. This organization basically got the rug pulled out from underneath it, and you know, it, it'd be nice to get that out in, in the public and, and mm. see what those politicians have to say about that. Well, then they've been doing some good fundraisers and stuff, like the coldest night, and mm -hmm. they've been really trying, you know, their ads on the radio, if I listen to it. God, it's hard to communicate with people these days. Um, they're doing the right things. Yeah. And and to address, like, I mean, I know a bit more about the situation, but we can be had in another conversation, but the issue with the town is something that they're trying to address. It's just the town's in a tough spot and they're in a tough spot mm -hmm. because there's no other facility for them to do this through. So they either keep plotting on the way that they are or shut down 
and there's no place for people who are hard to home. Like it, it's, it's why she pushes so hard and, and hasn't backed down to the from the town because there's just nowhere for those people to go if she shuts it down. So it's yeah, it's it. I feel for them. Like I talked to her quite a few times, and there she's in an un unenviable spot. I would support the increase to 5,000. Yeah. How about you, Dave? Yeah, um, I think, like, just, you know, when we talk about the community lunchbox and the ratio, um, the community lunchbox does see a lot of grants uh, versus this group that has, as Al said, had them pulled out from underneath of them, so they have nothing to go to, right? So um, I was aware of, of the group, um, but I was not aware of the need uh, this, the significance of the need sure. in the community of White Quartz. Okay. Well, if we're not exposed or educated, we don't know. Mm -hmm. right? Well, we all go and sleep in our warm beds and yeah. sometimes don't realize, right? Yeah, and that story that she told about the resident that if you weren't here, where would you be? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. And, I, and I can tell you that the facility, like what, what she's told you, she's there, they're not a homeless shelter, they're not there for emergency drop off. The RCMP drop people off there all the time because there's nowhere else to take them. We need one. And they mm -hmm. and they will take them in and find a place for them even though that's not really what they're trying to do. Yeah. Does that eat up all the money? Yeah. <laughs> it's that's right. Okay, so I was just changing? thinking what else can we do with the money? But it doesn't. It's okay. It doesn't need it. No, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's all good. about half of the surplus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any okay, so comments, the, Rebecca? No, thank you. It's important. Okay. Awesome. So the White Court Indigenous Friends Society, the Cultural Awareness and Training, and that one is supposed to be how much? 27? 2250. 2250. Which, honestly, if I can share with you guys, I thought was low. Yeah, me too. And I was... I they didn't ask for much last year either, though. Uh, four. Four thousand. Remember, Velma had to come back, and they had a little bit of a surplus, and she had to come back and present to you guys to see mm -hmm. they could spend, could spend the surplus. Spend yeah, it was about four thousand we gave them. That's what I like about Phase Group though. It's they are constantly under asking, yeah. trying to do what they can with it, and and it's going to create a great situation in the future for them when, when they come with a bigger ask because we're they're always showing fiscal responsibility and everything that they want to do. Absolutely. Once they're a center, they're yeah. they're going to be going gangbusters. Mm -hmm. so. Any further comments on that one? <clears throat> Is the total still the 44 in total then? Did you guys did the math? It would be 46, 300. 46, 650. 650. Mm -hmm. With the increase. But we'll have to do yours separately. Separately. Yeah. So 36, 650, right? So, yeah. Do you want me to make that motion? Can you zero? make that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. I'm gonna make, so somebody needs to make the motion for everything but the Eagle Tower Victim Services um, for the approval of the FCSS grants. Do you want me to say I'm allowed? I can do it. I, I, okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll make a motion that the Community Services Committee approves the following FCSS, FCSS grants. Blue Ridge Community League play group for $3,500. Blue Ridge Community League Golden Agers, 4,400. Community Lunchbox, Volunteer Recruitment and Retention, 1,500. Fort Assiniboine Moms and Tots Preschool, 15,000. Northwest Central Alberta FASD Parent Child Assistant Program, $5,000. Soaring Eagle Support Society Outreach Advocacy Staffing Supports, $5,000. And White Court Indigenous Friends Society Cultural Awareness Training, $22,250 for a total of $36,650. Okay, motion on the floor. All in favor? That's carried. Can someone make a motion to approve the uh, Eagle Tower Victim Services, a volunteer, volunteer advocate training and appreciation for $10,000? Correct, Chair. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll make. Uh, and then, does she have to say why she's abstaining? For the record, it doesn't matter. For the record, I'm abstaining because I'm the manager. 
program? I just pecuniary played. interest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'll make a motion that Community Services Committee approves the following FCS grant. Eagle Tower Victim Services, Volunteer Advocate Training and Appreciation for $10,000. Okay. All in favor? Motion carried. Okay, thanks everyone. That was painless. <laughs> right? Okay, so next we're going to go to the round table and we'll start with Dave. Uh, I apologize for not being here last month. I was away, but I uh, did cancel. cancel anyway. Yeah. So, uh, no, I appreciate it this evening. Like, just seeing these different groups, like, this, everything is eye opening, right? Um, just in regards to the need and the volunteers and the dedication of individuals just to, to make life better for, for everyone in, in Woodlands County, right? From the, the young ones uh, in the preschools to the seniors who everyone has been impacted by COVID, right? You see these groups um, being now being successful or looking to be, to, to flourish again, right? To give that sense of community, I think is so important. So. Jeremy, anything to share? Uh, not a whole lot. I did go to the community lunchbox celebration night last weekend, which was a lot of fun. Very well attended. I think they had sold out all but maybe one table. So very strong group there. Fantastic meal by the uh, butcher shop in town. I am drawing a blank on their name right North now. Country. North Country. <laughs> uh, man, that brisket was insane. <laughs> so it was a fantastic meal. And uh, they had a ton of volunteers there. So it was good to see, and I think everybody had a great time. Um, other than that, I just want to say we had a great conversation tonight. I, I, all these groups that we gave funding to, I think are going to really appreciate the amount of funding we gave them, and each one of them had an excellent case. So I'm glad, glad we could could approve it all. Councillor Dean. Uh, thank you. I don't really have a lot uh, in terms of a round table, table blue sky, but. Uh, just, uh, it's nice to see everybody again. It seems like it's been a long time since we've been together. Uh, and I'd reiterate what Jeremy said, that, you know, this, uh, this committee has uh, <clears throat> a pretty clear mandate and approving and uh, diagnosing these, these grants is, is a big, big part of what this committee does. And I'm, I'm happy to see that we had all the groups here and we had an opportunity to ask questions, learn about their operations, and I think it's a really, really valuable exercise for the committee to go through. So it was a, it was a good meeting. Okay. Joe? Um, I'll just give a couple updates. Um, we have been <clears throat> contacted by the province with respect to the Blue Ridge Rec area, and Alberta Transportation is looking at um, finally giving up their disposition for the gravel. Uh, which in turn means that at some point in time, um, <laughs> yeah, yay, uh, we can look at an expansion of the uh, the Blue Ridge Recreation Area to perhaps a campground, uh, day use area, and things like that. So our infrastructure department, um, and I guess we kind of got tagged in it as well. Um, there was a meeting last week, I unfortunately missed it, um, just to meet with the parties involved in it and then them providing us a little bit of a conceptual plan for the Blue Ridge Rec area that I think is probably in our master plan as well, our recreation master plan. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that and then um, as well council is looking at uh, there's a DML or a recreational lease over at Fort Assiniboine um, in which an individual uh, that's adjacent to it that runs the uh, RV park and marina there is interested in obtaining a portion of our DML. Um, so we're going to do an open house <clears throat> just to get the public's um, opinion, their comments on March 28th at Fort Assiniboine um, to see if it's viable in perhaps giving that portion of that rec lease up so that he can expand his. Um, it was originally obtained for the purpose of a tr walking trail from Fort Assiniboine down to, it's a boat launch area, east of the fort. Um, we would um, entertain in keeping about a 10 meter strip. Um, I know that the individual that's um, looking at the, 
obtaining the DML from the province um, has indicated that um, he'd be very willing to work with the county as well in, in perhaps getting that trail sooner than later as well. Because again, just um, our rec department, as everybody knows, 2019 was kind of decimated. And uh, so there's not the, the revenue there to be able to um, spend and uh, forge ahead on some of these projects. But uh, I think maybe if we can partner with um, this, this individual, if, if he's successful in obtaining the DML, and if it's kind of the, the will of, like I say, we wanted to get the public's comments to see what their thoughts were in us giving a portion of that up, um, and then the expansion of that. Our, uh, RV Park and Marina. Did you have thoughts, sir? Yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> so, kind of further to uh, or to add to what Joan's saying, I had at the last meeting asked to have the rec master plan put back on the agenda. It went to council and it's back in our purview. So, nice. it, there was a misunderstanding whether it was gone, but the, the fact is it's back under our purview. And so, um, I would like uh, this committee to have a look at it and um, you know there's a few things that I think have changed in the last 10 years that, that I'd like us to look at and uh, um, I'll just plant a seed uh, river access is uh, is one thing that I'd really like the committee to look at. Okay. Heather did you have anything else? Um, that just to encourage you to volunteer nominate a volunteer in your community there's so many that's the more we get, the better it is. And if it's diverse, you all know a volunteer. You are all volunteers. Um, just like to see more of that. And next month will be our recreation and arts and culture grants. So we'll have more groups that are doing stuff, real cool stuff. I know of three that are applying. But I always it always comes late. It's the end of the month that they're due, end of March. So that'll be another fun month. But nominate someone today. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing the ads everywhere, so that's good. Did you um, no, I don't really have anything other than that's awesome news about the um, gravel. Trail. Like that's exciting because that was our one of our plans was to put that into rustic camping, and that I think that just fits within that um, whole area of the uh, dirt biking and stuff. I just think it would be very popular, so I'm excited to hear that. Very excited. <coughs> so, but again, uh, having people sorry, no, you having people come and do their presentation, I think, also shows their commitment too, right? Because some people um, don't understand how important for us to ask the questions, and I think it was great tonight. Yeah. So. Good. Um, I guess just thank you, and I learned a lot, and I thought this was very important, and um, I guess I have a better understanding of what's really going on in our community. So, yeah. so I want to thank you guys for the great meeting. Great. Um, I just wanted, is there a follow-up with the project that you were doing for the um, study that we had a presentation on last, last yeah, month? The needs assessment? The needs assessment? Wait, they're not done. Like, okay. As I mentioned in my report, they're still doing some mapping and okay. in, interviewing other stakeholders like service providers and such. Okay. We're not expecting anything probably till April. Okay. And nice. then it'll come to you guys. Maybe we could kill two birds with one stone because council needs to hear it too, but come and bringing them up twice and so we might be able to do a joint meeting. I don't know. This, that's just me spitballing. I don't know if that could actually happen. Okay. But, yeah. Is there a specific topic? No, no, I just, just wondering because I probably did read it, but I was kind of thought I should mention it. Um, there is some programming and stuff that we're doing, um, I guess, town-related stuff with Woodlands County. Um, for getting that connectedness back. Um, we had a Percy Baxter skate thing that was supposed to be tonight. That's why I wasn't supposed to be here, but um, just with the weather being gonna be so nice next week, we just bumped it because it seemed silly. Um, but those kind of things are gonna be popping up a lot in the community within our power group in the town. And um, we have partners with AHS and we're realizing that we need people to get out and you know come together. So. That's kind of the purpose of those when you see them. We'll be doing the another version of the summer um, park parties as well. And that's doing them in people's backyards to bring them out again, um, trying to do those 
small things that hopefully they start to do themselves because with COVID it sure shut people down. Mm -hmm. And we're noticing it even at the detachment level when things are happening and it's because people aren't connected to others that I think that is a big part of the problem. So it's all part of the big picture, um, trying to get people out. So share those when you see them because um, they are important. Th those are done, I know you mentioned power, but are those through the Community Services Committee? Do they? No. That's through your crime prevention? I sit on it with crime prevention power group, which is the drug I can sit on it for everybody. Do you know which councillor sits on the Community Services Committee from the town? Derek. No, from us. Yeah. You. Yeah. Can you send minutes? Because we used to circulate minutes. I think it was part of our yeah, information package, package. But I, they don't, the town doesn't send them to me. Okay. So can you forward? Yeah. Yeah, there's probably a bunch in my phone I can send. Mm -hmm. Do you want the most current ones? Do the most current ones, and I'll include them next month okay. for, your, for everybody's <clears throat> information. Because that'd be good to know to see what they're talking about. And yeah, and, and I have to, uh, um, I don't know what mission to give here. I've had so many conflicts with that meeting that um, I, so I attended their planning session and probably three last year and the rest I just had conflicts that I wasn't able to attend. But I do read the packages and, um, you know, provide comments, etc. cetera. Um, and it's a very well-run committee as well. Yeah, nice Bridget too. sits on it. <clears throat> There's um, our town hall for the RCMP had four people come to it. Is that right? Eh? Four? That's, that's all. One was the mayor of White Court. Mm -hmm. So we will be doing... Um, we're going to Blue Ridge on Monday to their um, meeting, and then we will be hosting another one uh, in April, probably. And I was going to talk to you maybe about a senior um, event for SEPTED, which is our crime prevention through environmental design presentation, because we've had a lot of rule break-ins mm -hmm. that um, would be helpful tools for seniors and others to protect their properties. Definitely. Not just seniors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost a senior, so <laughs> they're very active in Blue Ridge. Like if you're if you're on Facebook, there's there's they're actually posting pictures. This guy's in my backyard right now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's unfortunate that we only had the very well. We didn't even do the presentation. We had brought people in to do the, and we didn't do it because there was three people there. Do you think the timing? Like, well, it was two to four, it was right? two to four, and purposely because we've done them at seven o'clock and nobody shows up oh, too. So yeah. we thought we'd try something new, and it didn't work. So we will try again. It was in my calendar, but our council meeting spilled into it. <clears throat> so Sergeant Dodds was here from uh, um, Farhead. Farhead, and I, so, I think he was intending on going, but. We had that presentation from... Uh, oh, from Dr. Kenton. So that's it. Anybody else think of anything else before we close her up? Okay, so next meeting is April 13th at 5.30 as well. Yeah, it'll be 5.30, and it, it's not going to be huge, but you're going to have your rec grants and the award nominees. Okay. So I'm traveling, so I'll do it 13th. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> All right. They're more important. We're going to adjourn at 7.42. Do we need a motion? I never know. I'll make a motion.